Hey everyone, I want to show you a new paper that just came out on the rapid evolution of a Daphnia population. Now, what are Daphnia exactly and why is this paper important? Let's have a look. Daphnia is a genus with hundreds of species of small aquatic crustaceans that are a few millimeters long, sometimes called water fleas. So what was the discovery here? What was this paper about? This is the press release from University of Birmingham and it talks about rapid evolution. Skipping down, strikingly evolution in response to predation pressure occurs within just a few generations. This is a remarkable discovery. They say here, we were able to show clearly how rapid evolution took place. Really? That is amazing. Uh, let's have a look here. This is the paper itself. Um, here's the abstract. talks about rapid evolution, uh, evolutionary trajectory, uh, rapid adaptive evolution, and they observed ev this, this evolution. This is a remarkable finding. There's just one problem. All of this is false. And so let's have a look at this. First of all, uh, they discovered and observed adaptation, not evolution. Let's have a look at the uh, dive deep down here into the paper and have a look at some of the quotes here. Um, they say extensive standing genetic variation fuels rapid evolution. Okay, let's have a look here. Um, our study reveals how natural populations can harbor substantial standing genetic variation. I'm talking about this standing genetic variation. Our results show that the substantial genetic variation enabling the observed rapid genome-wide response. So this is important. The genetic variation, this substantial standing genetic variation is what enabled the re this, this evolution they're talking about. One more quote here. Uh, standing genetic variation which enables rapid evolution and provides a high evolutionary rescue potential. So you get the point here. It, this standing genetic variation is the key. It enabled the uh, evolutionary response that they're talking about. I mean, let's just look at the title of the paper. Extensive standing genetic variation. This is the key point here. Standing genetic variation enabled this uh, evolution that they're talking about. Well, that's not evolution the genetic instructions were already present. That's not evolution. What was happening was they were, this, uh, this Daphnia species they were looking at was adapting by uh, shuffling around the pre-existing genetic information. Genetic instructions were already present. So let, let, let's just summarize what actually happened. So. Um, they, they looked at genetic data from a population of Daphnia over several decades in the 1970s up to 1990s from a man-made pond in Belgium. That pond had fish stocked in it in the late 1970s. Uh, the Daphnia in the pond adapted to the presence of the predators. Again, this, this adaptation was uh, fueled or used, leveraged existing standing genetic variation. That's adaptation. The, the adaptations were evident in the genetic data, so they recovered this, these genetic data for several, decade, for several decades. They were able to perceive and measure some of this response, some of these adaptations. The adaptations were using existing genetic variation. So let's have a look at just one of the charts in the paper here. This x-axis here, the horizontal axis, is time so the pre-fish is before the stocking. The high fish is during in the middle of this uh, fish stocking in the late 1970s. And then on the right there, the reduced fish is after the 1970s, after the stocked fish were, were reducing. And the y-axis is this our, our, the, the value of various traits, the trait value. So let's just look, have a look at, say, uh, size at maturity, the second tra trait on this list here, that the red line shows size at maturity. It's right, it's right there. So it goes down and then it goes back up. So it reverses. It responds to the predation pressure 
and then when the predation uh, relieves, it goes back to where it was. It reverses. So this is sig significant to the researchers in that, okay, there was a response, there was an adaptation, and then it could go back when, that, when the uh, predation pressure relieved. These minor changes do not add up to evolution. This is important. The trait variations that they are seeing, do, they don't just accumulate over millions of years to create, or, or tens of years, or, uh, to create evolution. Okay, there's no scientific evidence that minor changes like this can add up to evolution. In fact, the scientific evidence is squarely against this. This is well known. There's no good evidence that this can happen. So it is very important not to refer to this as evolution because that is misleading. This is adaptation. These are different things. Adaptation is not evolution. Evolution is not adaptation. You do not use the word evolution where it doesn't apply. That's misleading. What did not happen here? There was no speciation. There was no body plan changes. There were no, no new appendages in these Daphnia, no new organs, no new metabolic pathways, no new organic molecules, no new genes. It was adaptation, not evolution. Let's have a look at that press release again. We were able to quantify the genetic diversity of one particular Daphnia population over nearly two decades and show, and show clearly how rapid evolution took place. Really? No, you didn't. It was adaptation. Let's replace that word evolution with adaptation. We were able to quantify the genetic diversity of one particular Daphnia population over nearly two decades to show clearly how rapid the adaptation took place. Ah, now it reads correctly. With the, way they wrote, the way they wrote it, they added the term evolution gratuitously. It's not does not apply. Now, looking at the paper itself, the term evolution appears all over the place, and the same rule applies. You can go through and replace that word evolution with adaptation with no loss of generality. This is a violation of Occam's razor, a fundamental rule in scientific research. You do not multiply entities. You do not gratuitously add um, more explanation that is necessary to explain the data. It's very important, very important concept in evolution, which they are violating. Now you might wonder, well, why would they do this? Well, actually, there's a reason. Now, this is common in the literature, in the evolution literature. Adaptation is conflated with evolution. In, in fact, it goes one step further. Adaptation is actually used as evidence, powerful evidence for evolution. I'm going to show you just a few examples of this. Um, one example is this peppered moth example from the um, 19th century and 20th century where um, they, a, a population of moths in England was mostly light. You can see there in 1848, 95% of this population of moths in, in England uh, were light. And some of the 5% of the individuals were dark. So you had dark moths, you had light moths. You then had pollution. The trees turned dark. This is the story that is told. The trees turned dark and the moths evolved to become dark so that they would hide better. They could avoid predators better. So the pollution, the industrial pollution, drove this evolution. It's an example of evolution in action. Then you, clean, then you cleaned up the air. You, had, uh, you cleaned up the, the pollution. Uh, the trees uh, be, went back to being light and the, the moths could go back to being light. So this is evolution in action. Well, it isn't evolution. This is adaptation. The like, same sort of a problem exists here. But Isaac Asimov, one of many people who tout this as powerful evidence for evolution, he wrote that these mere color changes in the peppered moth prove evolution. Now note that prove, not an example of even an example of would be incorrect, but he goes much further than this. He says it proves evolution. That is false. That is not even close. This is misleading. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's not scientific, not a scientific statement. Um, here's another example of this conflating adaptation with, with evolution. Professor Marta Wayne uh, says, evolution is change in gene frequency. No, it is not change in gene frequency. That is not evolution. 
That is adaptation. Same problem here. Uh, Professor Steve Jones. The changes observed in the HIV virus contain Darwin's entire argument. False. Not even close. HIV is a virus. It's not even life. This is not even close to evolution. These are mutations in a virus. Professor Pamela Bjorkman uh, says much the same thing. She talks about a how a mutating virus is evolution at work. And she goes on to compare this to human evolution and the mammalian uh, uh, immune system and how immune responses are just an example of evolution. No, immune responses are not evolution. It's another conflation. Um, it, it's completely different things. The immune response is searching for a binding surface. That's it. It's completely different than evolution. She's conflating those topics. Now, why are they saying these things? So there's a long history behind this, which is beyond the scope of this video. But to cut to the quick here, evolutionists are living in a world where there are two possibilities illustrated here in this box here. One possibility is that the world is completely fixed, static and unchanging. Or the other possibility is everything arose by chance, evolution is true, the universe evolved by random chance and natural selection. Those are your, those are your choices. Either the world is completely static or evolution is true. You show me one change, one species that changed somehow, and oh, that proves all of evolution. I know this sounds ridiculous, but there's a long history behind this. It comes from religious beliefs, and it fuels evolutionary thought. And that's why you see these absurd statements uh, in these evolutionists. It's a false dichotomy, obviously. It is a logical fallacy. Okay, number two here, the genetic variation. Let's get back to this genetic variation that we've been talking about. Uh, they write in the paper, our results also testify to the importance of standing genetic variation. Well, yeah, certainly that was key to their, to their study. Uh, skipping down, this standing genetic variation is maintained throughout time, irrespective of the responses to selection. So it's maintained. You don't just use it up. Um, skipping down, Rapid evolution fueled by standing genetic variation has been, sh has, been, has been shown in both vertebrate and invertebrate taxa. So it's not just these daphnia. This is a general uh, tr um, finding. Okay? So the, the key here is the importance of this genetic variation. They are utterly relying on this genetic variation in order to show their uh, so-called evolution. But wait, from where did the genetic variation come? Where did the laws of genetics come? Where did the required cellular machinery come? Where did these things come from? Evolution has no scientific explanation for this. So to summarize here so far, uh, first, not only did we see that evolutionists conflate adaptation with evolution, but now we also see that evolutionists rely on pre-existing genetic information and molecular machinery which they cannot explain. This isn't looking very good. Uh, evolution is piggybacking on biology. Now let's move down to the conclusion of the paper here. They write, the insights offered by our study on the origin and maintenance of standing genetic variation are highly relevant in the context of how evolution can modulate ecological responses. Oh, wait a minute now. Evolution takes on a whole new meaning here. They've changed. They've switched. The term evolution has been synonymous with adaptation throughout the paper. And now at the end, suddenly it becomes a global creation agent. Okay, you see this? Throughout the paper, evolution has been uh, synonymous with adaptation, but now all of a sudden, evolution modulates ecological responses. This is why it's so important not to conflate these terms, not to violate Occam's razor. You need not to do this. You've got to stay straight on the terms and the concepts. The study analyzed the Daphnia's built-in adaptation machine, a fantastic built-in adaptation machine which allows Daphnia to respond to environmental threats and challenges. Now I want to finish up with diapause. What is diapause? 
because the study depended on diapause. Um, diapause is kind of like hibernation for eggs and many insects and small species use diapause. So eggs go into quote unquote hibernation or diapause in response to environmental cues such as temperature or lighting that may indicate the, uh, the uh, uh, end of a season so, or uh, predation pressure, things like this. So there are times when instead of going through its normal life cycle, the eggs will actually go into a hibernation and wait for a change to come around. The researchers exploited this by recovering old eggs that had been, uh, from a diapause cycle uh, in this pond. So they were able to actually recover uh, eggs from uh, previous decades over time and build up a rec build up a time history uh, of the gen genetics that they could recover from these eggs over many years. So that's how they got this genetic information in the first place to do this study. It's a good idea. But diapause contradicts evolution. Why? Well, diapause, the whole system of diapause relies on a lot of very complicated, sophisticated, interrelated uh, systems or subsystems. So you have to have sensors that sense these changes, whether it's temperature, uh, lighting, uh, predation, whatever. Then you have to have that information provided to some logic circuits uh, that decide what to do. And they have to make the right decisions based on what those conditions that the sensors reported. Obviously, if you uh, don't don't have the parameters correct, you're going to come up with the wrong answer. So it's it's not just having this logic in place, but the parameters have to be correct. And then uh, you have to be able to take action on that information. So you got the sensing of the environment, you got the logic that decides what to do about it, and then then take action on it. Um, this isn't going to evolve, okay? Uh, this is this is much much too complicated. Way too many mutations are required to happen simultaneously. You can't build this up slowly, one mutation at a time. So this diapause contradicts evolutionary theory. Now we might say, wait a minute, uh, didn't a simple diapause evolve in some ancient ancestor way back when, when it was very crude? The ancestor was crude, the diapause was crude, that maybe it didn't work very well. And then slowly over the millennia, over the millions of years, uh, it, it was passed down via common descent and slowly you know, refined and got better. That's the usual story that you hear from evolutionists to get around this problem of high complexity in biology. Well, it just evolved over you know, millions and millions of years, billions of years. Well, no, that doesn't work. Uh, first of all, that, that whole story, you can't really put that together. You can't get around the complexity problem just simply by playing it out over millions of years. You still have to solve that problem. But it gets worse. And that is, um, this diapause has been found to, if evolution is true, granting, let's just go with that premise, even if evolution is true, it turns out that diapause must have evolved rapidly and independently many times. Here's just this paper about killfish, for example, and they write, the ability to produce diapause eggs evolved independently at least six times within African and South American killfish. Now, there's actually no in evidence that this evolved independently six times. What they're really saying here is it must have, if evolution is true, then we have to conclude, we have to admit that diapause must have evolved independently at least six times. They don't actually have evidence that it actually evolved six times. They're simply assuming evolution is true. Um, so you have convergent evolution. That's, here's another paper, rapid adaptive evolution of the diapause program in mosquitoes. Uh, here's a lab that looks, that studies um, uh, dormancy and, uh, and diapause. Many life history strategies seem to be highly evolutionary, evolutionarily uh, labile, evolving independently multiple times across a phylogeny. And it's no different for diapause. Dormancy s seems to fit this bill, appearing to evolve rapidly within closely related clades. 
it is surprisingly non-conserved. Okay, so it's non-conserved, it's lineage specific, and it has rapid appearance. This is not evolution, okay? This is not the common descent pattern that we talked about a minute ago. Didn't it just occur once in some ancient um, you know, ancestor and then slowly refine over the millions and millions of years? No. Even if you're an evolutionist, you must admit that story does not work. Even if you believe in evolution, you have to admit, oh, this thing somehow arises rapidly all over the place, independently in different species from time to time. This is not evolution. It is making no sense on evolution. The whole point of evolution is this common descent pattern and how things are inherited from, in, uh, from ancestors and slowly, gradually refines by random mutations. That's not what the evidence shows over and over and over again. This is one example paper or one example idea, uh, 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 one example system, diapause, um, that shows this. This appears, it is ubiquitous in biology. So to summarize, evolutionists incorrectly conflate adaptation with evolution. We saw that. Evolutionists rely on pre-existing genetic information and molecular machinery, which they cannot explain. We saw that. And now evolutionists rely on diapause, which they cannot explain. So we started out with a paper filled with so much promise, and in the end, got a paper filled with so many lies.